Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tufty speaking from Washington, D.C., and we're recording our broadcast on the afternoon of Friday, December 27th. So we're right in the middle of the 12 days of Christmas and the holiday season in general, and we uh, wish everybody uh, the best of uh, of everything in the old year and the new year. Now, we're on the eve of a dramatic event. Uh, as of tomorrow, the 28th of December, the extended unemployment benefits will be cut off for 1.3 million American families. This is a bipartisan betrayal of the public interest. It is a betrayal with overtones of genocide, because since we've had the cuts in food stamps, we're now in the second month of reduced food stamp benefits. So now that we're towards the end of December, just at the time that abundance was rejoicing in the Christmas holiday, that's the time when many of these stricken families were running out of food stamps to put food on the table. And that certainly happened already around Thanksgiving in November, and it's happening again now in December. And those food stamp cuts have to be restored. But now, even more serious for the people that are are involved, the sole source of income, 1.3 million families, now immediately on the 28th of December, followed soon by 1.9 additional million families, 1.9 million families, during the course of 2014, for a total of 3.2 million families. So we're talking about 10 million people. And the question is, how many will have to die? How many children, how many sick people, old people, cripples, and so forth? How many will die? And those deaths go to the account of the Republican Party primarily, with a secondary role for the Democrats. But in line with our general perspective here, it is certainly the lion's share goes to the Republican Party, and therefore that party must be destroyed. The Republican Party must be destroyed in place during 2014 as part of a mass strike upsurge, which will be building, in my estimate, by the time of the October to November election wrap-up. Now, ironically, the 28th of December, this is when the the cutoff will occur. That falls on a Saturday this year. Let's go back and just take a look at the Gospel according to St. Matthew, because we're talking now about the festival of the Western Church known as the Holy Innocents. It is the time when the oppressive King Herod, king of the uh, puppet state created by the Roman Empire in Judea, Herod ordered the killing of all young children. So we have in Matthew uh, 2, 1 to 23, uh, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, In the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, trying to find uh, the uh, infant whose coming had been foretold, foretold by the star. And they ask, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we are come to worship him. When Herod the king heard those things, he was troubled. And when he gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And when Herod called the wise men, he inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And then, treacherously, he said, Go and search for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also, and of course, the goal was uh, to uh, to kill the possible competitor for the 
post of the king of Judea. So God has to warn St. Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And Joseph has to get St. Mary in the night and flee into Egypt. This is the flight into Egypt, one of, one of the great subjects of Renaissance uh, painting. Uh, Herod, when he saw that he was not getting any intelligence from the wise men, sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. And there we have it. That's the slaughter of the innocents. And, of course, the uh, wise men, the magi coming from the east, eventually do get to see uh, Jesus, right? Remember that the January 5th is Twelfth Night. That's the last of the 12 days of Christmas. But then, January 6th, the Epiphany, the time when you get to see what's what. You get to see, in this case, the face of, of God. So, the Holy Innocence. Now, what, 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 what a more horrible irony that we should be in this day and age, right after 2,000 years of Christianity, we're going to have the new slaughter of the innocents, except this time in the role of King Herod, we have the reactionary monsters of the Republican Party and, of course, their Wall Street Democratic uh, cohorts. But remember, if you smash the Republican Party, this entire dog and pony show falls apart. And my estimate is that the Republican Party is closer to collapse than the Democratic one. Both show signs of severe uh, distress, of course, right, as we see in all the polls, right? But the Republican Party is more ripe for collapse than the Democrats, and that also then opens up the positive scenario of breaking the Democratic Party into two parts with the plutocratic Wall Street Democrats of Obama, Schumer, Durbin, and the rest of them, Pelosi, against the populists, the people with some labor connections or some... New Deal nostalgia, or something of this sort, the Sherrod Brown, the Elizabeth Warren, Marcy Captor, DeFazio, and the rest of them. Uh, uh, Congressman Conyers of uh, Michigan certainly would, would qualify with his uh, jobs bill, with jobs, government jobs in this case, created by a small uh, Wall Street sales tax, what he calls a, a transaction tax. So here we are, on the eve of the Holy Innocents, and this time it's going to be American families with, with their children that pay the terrible price. 1.3 million families, as of the Feast of the Holy Innocents, will be high and dry. Now, we've also got, as I said, cuts in food stamps for the second month. We've got a situation with the minimum wage, which is getting worse all the time, and needs urgent relief. The answer, in terms of every part of this that has government spending behind it, is the Wall Street sales tax. This is now the spirit of the age. It is the uh, idea whose time has come. The Wall Street sales tax. The only way you can find revenue to pay for a social safety net worthy of the name is to break the immunity of Wall Street against taxation and make them pay, make them pay their federal income tax on turnover, but above all, on, on profits, but above all, make them pay a tax on turnover. Back in a minute. And welcome back to World Choices Radio. with are here in Washington, D.C., inviting you during the uh, holiday time when you may have a little bit of uh, free time here and there. Take a look at C-SPAN and check out my... Lecture on the Russian fleets, right? We've had another round of hysterical anti-Russian, anti-Putin propaganda. We've got uh, uh, Khodorkovsky being released. That becomes an occasion for hysterical attacks on 
uh, Putin. We've got uh, the Pussy Riot release. We've got Greenpeace fanatics uh, and uh, people who are obviously doing some pretty uh, dangerous maneuvers there in the Arctic Ocean. They're being released. Hysterical anti-Putin attacks. And, of course, uh, Ukraine, where it looks like the NATO provocateurs have been defeated for the moment. There is even an attempt to expand this into Belarus. This is done by Anne Applebaum, among others, the wife of the Polish Foreign Minister Sikorsky, but she appears as a columnist in the Washington Post, and they don't label every time that she's the uh, relative by marriage of the Polish Foreign Minister, right? One of the leading hotheads and provocateurs, this uh, Sikorsky. Um, so that's, uh, that's what's going on, and that's why the lecture on the Russian fleets, I submit, is extremely timely. It shows a bedrock of uh, positive cooperation, which can uh, only be ignored at the peril of everybody in the world. And one of the things that we're seeing, and we may see it even more in January, is that we are going, certainly in the Middle East, maybe not in the rest of the world, but a U.S.-Russian condominium can be discerned through the mist and the smoke and the uh, hysterical propaganda, the idea is that if anything positive is going to get done, it's going to be on the model of the solution to the Syrian chemical weapons. We'll talk some more about Syria in a minute. So the idea is that if you're going to do a reenactment of the three kings, right, we three kings of Orient are, uh, then you're going to have to have Herod. King Herod has to appear, right, that mean oppressor, that, uh, that killer, King Herod. Who's going to play the role of King Herod this time? Should it be Rand Paul, who wanted to cut off the unemployment benefits? And he said I, he's doing them a favor, because, boy, if you have on your resume that you haven't worked for more than 26 weeks, you'll never get another job again. So little Rand is helpfully going to, uh, going to come and... Uh, and, and avoid that for you, right? You won't be able to get more than 26 weeks of unemployment benefits, if that, under the Rand Paul regime. Little Rand, who uh, uh, has never wanted in his life and who has never known uh, hardship or anything of the sort, uh, is there to tell you that, uh, boy, it's really bad if you get your resume soiled with too many weeks of unemployment benefits. Or maybe we should have Boehner, play the role of King Herod, right, since he's the one who prevented this from going through. Or maybe it's Mitch McConnell, or maybe it's others. And, of course, among the retainers, right, among the, uh, among the scribes, we've got plenty of room for Harry Reid and, uh, and Schumer and Durbin and Pelosi and so forth. But the principal villain, right, the star villain is the Republican part of this show. So as we continue in the 12 days of Christmas, heading towards the 12th night and then Epiphany on the 6th, just remember the slaughter of the innocents. And of those 1.3 million families now, to, soon to be joined by 1.9 million families, I want to know how many will die. The notion of the death clock uh, is not abandoned. It's just it's a complicated, um, complicated uh, device to Create. It's essentially a very. It's a challenging um, pro prospect to put that into a uh, into a, an algorithm or a, a computer program. But we can also point out certain obvious uh, dangers. I've been using the figure of twenty six thousand Americans who die every year from lack of medical care. As I've now discovered during the. Obamacare debate back in 2009-2010, the New York Times was using a figure of more than 50,000 Americans who die every year as a result of lack of medical care. And of course, if you want to deal with that, there's really only one responsible way, that is Medicare for all. Everybody is eligible $100 per person per month, and if you're destitute, if you're unemployed, you get it for free. And if that's a burden for you, if that's a hardship, then subsidies kick in. Uh, and, of course, this never had a chance. Obama never, never gave that a chance. 
Uh, he talked about some public option. Nobody ever knew what that was. The clear response was Medicare for all. Tested, popular, everybody understands it. Mechanisms already in place working closely with the Social Security Administration, avoids you all the problems of the website and the, uh, the, the entire rigmarole of Obamacare. Having said that, though, now that we've reached this point, right, we're now just a couple of days away from Americans, at least some of them, being able to exercise their right, their God-given inalienable right, to medical care. This is an economic necessity, a humanitarian necessity. It is needed for the development of this labor force. Don't let Ron Paul and Rand Paul tell you you don't have a right to medical care. You damn well do have a right to medical care. And any despicable politician who gets in the way of that needs to be swept aside. And I am confident that they will be uh, as time goes on. We've also got uh, lunatics, uh, for example, the editorial board of the Washington Post, wants they want more regressive taxation. And it starts from a, this lunatic that we've mentioned, I think, in previous broadcasts. The liberal Democrat, Earl Blumenauer of Oregon, says he wants to increase the federal gas tax by 15 cents a gallon. And the Washington Post says... That's a modest price to replenish a dwindling federal highway fund. So they start with this. The bill has one sponsor, as far as I know. That's Blumenauer, obviously a green Malthusian fanatic uh, who does not uh, belong in the Congress. Uh, he wants to practically double it. Right now, the federal gasoline tax is at 18.4 cents a gallon, and the Washington Post demagogically says, why, it's been that way for the last 20 years, since 1993, and therefore it's time to raise it. Well, I'm a sorry, no more regressive taxation, only progressive taxation, and of the progressive taxes, the one we want to start with is the Wall Street sales tax. Every serious discussion of the safety net and economic policy gets you back to that 1% Wall Street sales tax as the beginning of rational discourse. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. It's the third day of Christmas, the third of 12, and then at the end of that you have uh, epiphany when certain things ought to be clearer. Well, one of the things that's becoming clearer on the 28th, that is the Holy Innocence, is that the new Herod is abroad in the land, the new slaughter of the innocents, and that's the Republican Party for blocking the extended unemployment benefits, right? In many states, uh, you could get more than 26 weeks as a result of uh, various provisions of the much maligned stimulus program of early 2009, <clears throat> and that, uh, that stimulus has now run out. So the extended unemployment benefits are running out. We're, we're seeing a cascade of these things. At the end of October, <clears throat> the increased food stamp budget also ran out, so we're, we've reverted to a lower rate of food stamps, and we now are reverting to only 26 weeks. <clears throat> so if you're above 26 weeks in just about every state, you're going to be out of luck. And, of course, the 99ers have long since disappeared from anybody's calculations but their own. The Republicans never wanted them. The Democrats some made some noises. I'm thinking of Ed Schultz. He was going to fight for the 99ers, and we haven't heard anything much about them lately. But um, my answer to all of this is the Wall Street sales tax, the 1% Wall Street sales tax. Now, that allows you to stabilize people by fully funding all the things that you need, the unemployment benefits, the food stamps, the Head Start, the uh, S-CHIP, uh, and everything else, WIC, nutrition, other kinds of health and nutritional services. Now, that is to, <clears throat> to keep your labor force alive and intact and uh, able to work. But now, in addition to that, you've got to have a recovery. 
and the recovery gets us into the terrain of the Federal Reserve, because whatever these Keynesians are going to tell you, the only way to get sufficient credit resources to finance a broad-based recovery with the necessary 30 million jobs is not the federal budget. That simply will not do. In the world of credit default swaps and hedge funds and these predators, that uh, vampires that fly across the world looking for blood-sucking objects, you simply cannot burden the U.S. federal budget with that uh, entire task of creating 30 million jobs. It's not necessary. Why not use the obvious resource of the central bank? Now we've just, uh, we're having the 100th anniversary of the Federal Reserve this week. And what I say is this has been 100 years, uh, just about, well, most of the time, it has been a misguided uh, policy. The Federal Reserve has understood itself as a service by government to the banks and to the banks alone. And this is what must be changed. This is the idea that must yield to the idea of full employment, to be sure, but full employment in the context of maximizing science, technology, industry, progress, Increased living standards, increased longevity, those need to be built in, too. So full employment, <clears throat> but at union wages and the possibility of preparing your labor force for the uh, technologies now of the middle and the end of the 21st century, going towards the year 2100. That's what you've got to be thinking about when you make Fed policy. And therefore, these Lilliputians, these lobotomized, individuals like Yellen or Stanley Fisher, these, uh, what are they? Some of them were lucky if they're Keynesians. And of course, the Keynesians, because the master talked about a transaction tax, the Keynesian is willing to accept a transaction tax. But unfortunately, this remains vitiated by a deep Malthusian influence. We just had an article in one of the British papers about a descendant of Lord Keynes uh, who is also a descendant of Darwin. And there you see it, right? Malthus, Darwin, Keynes, a line of degeneracy, a line of pessimism, and the rejection of modern uh, progress, because this, these, are, these are the ideological effluvia of the decadent British aristocracy. So we say no to Yellen, no to Stanley Fisher, my God, even worse, with no attempt even to... Uh, to hide it, right? Yellen operates, obviously, under left cover. With Stanley Fisher, we've got the Bilderberger Group and everything else, the Central Bank of Israel, the IMF, the World Bank, Citibank, MIT, Oxford, and on and on. Basically, a, a, a catalog of, of uh, monstrosities, of, uh, of freaks of nature, I guess we'd have to say. And try somebody like me, the Tarpley for Fedhead campaign, goes on. Yellen has not yet been confirmed. They say that Yellen is a shoe in sometime in January, but uh, that will not do. And uh, Stanley Fisher will then have to be confirmed if he gets uh, nominated. And um, it's quite possible that if this rebellion of the at least uh, verbally populist Democrats, if that goes on, then Stanley Fisher is going to have a hard time uh, as well. And then we've also got Greenspan. Greenspan is now out on book tour. I don't want to comment on Greenspan as a philosopher of history, Greenspan as an elder statesman. Greenspan should be serving time in the big house, in the pen, for federal crimes. That's where Greenspan belongs. But he shows up on Morning Joe. Uh, the idea that this character can pontificate is it just shows you the ideological bankruptcy. Hey, Occupy, they went around boasting a couple of years ago that they had changed the national conversation. Well, apparently they didn't change it for long enough or far enough so that two years later Greenspan can come forward as a sage, as a philosopher, a philosopher king, uh, as an oracle. Right, And this uh, is obviously unacceptable. Now, 
the whole business, the, the, the background on the Federal Reserve, obviously, is that this was uh, a project willed by Morgan. There, there is a, a fairly new biography now of Grover Cleveland, and there's an attempt to make Grover Cleveland uh, look like the last conservative small government man of the Democratic Party. Well, no, he was a neo-Confederate doe-faced copperhead, is what Grover Cleveland was. And in his uh, second term in particular, with the Panic of 1893, Grover Cleveland personified the implacable contempt of a government for the suffering of its citizens, right? the, the uh, hard-hearted rejection of any anti-cyclical measures. Right? It was the, he was sort of the last Austrian. He's the closest thing to an Austrian I guess we've had. Uh, Grover Cleveland became widely hated. You can see in my book, uh, Surviving the Cataclysm, it's a, you can see the story of a, of a married couple who run out of food, and they, deci- they decide then that there's nothing they can do. They're going to die. And that's, that, was for, uh, that was supposedly good enough for the American public under Grover Cleveland. Grover Cleveland kept saying, oh, I'd love to do something to help you, but I can't because I can't violate the laws of the free market. Well, that's a libertarian, right? That's an Austrian. That's, uh, that's a neo-Confederate uh, outlook. So remember what, what Grover Cleveland did, which this book tends to obscure. There was just an interview with the, this uh, reactionary talk show host, Dennis Prager, with the author of the Grover Cleveland book. Remember that the crisis was an attack on the gold backing of the U.S. dollar. And as long as London controlled the world gold market, this was a tremendous vulnerability. So London was attacking the dollar through the gold backing of the dollar, and they forced Grover Cleveland to grovel on his hands and knees in front of J.P. Morgan in order to save what was to be saved in Wall Street. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Just reviewing the hundred years of the Federal Reserve, and obviously the, the, the great failures have been the post-war panic after World War I, right? The, the great panic of 1920, which the Federal Reserve helped to provoke, didn't do anything to stop it. And I know the Austrians and the Libertarians celebrate that panic. They think that was so great, all that unemployment so fast. Yeah, that's what the, brought the world Mussolini and fascism. The March on Rome, October 1922, is a direct fruit of that wonderful, exalted panic of 1920-21-22. Then, of course, the Great uh, Depression, uh, starting with the <clears throat> the stock market bubble of 1927-28-29, the crash of 1929, the total inability to get a recovery or to save a banking system, right, given the uh, ideologies that uh, prevailed. Even Herbert Hoover will uh, agree with you on that. And then the Federal Reserve goes through a phase where from about 1933 until the middle 1950s, really technically 1952, it's about 20 years where they are in effect nationalized by Franklin D. Roosevelt, who would call them up and tell them what they were going to do. And that was it, because they knew that if they bucked FDR, that he could easily orchestrate, or could orchestrate, a move in Congress to abolish the Fed, to nationalize it. And that, of course, is what should have been done, just with all the other reactionary attacks. He never got around to it. That's really unfortunate, because this is, out of all of them, perhaps the most important in terms of domestic policy. And then, of course, the uh, gradual deregulation of derivatives from 1982 to 1999, and then, less than 10 years after that, a new world panic. This time, however, uh, not quite as bad as 1929, because the same monetarist uh, criteria were not uh, applied. Right? We didn't get the immediate deflation, but we may be about to get the deflation. Right? And I know all the libertarians think deflation, yeah, yeah, great. Uh, well, you've got to be very, very rich to celebrate uh, deflation. Right? You've got to be really uh, rolling in dough for deflation to do you any good. So anyway, the, the, the essential outline of the Federal Reserve is that Grover Cleveland capitulated to J.P. Morgan and London 
1895. And the idea was, if the United States allows Morgan and London to control the public debt of the U.S., then London and Morgan will call off their dogs and stop attacking the gold backing of the U.S. dollar. And that was the capitulation. That is the great sellout by Grover Cleveland. And that is then what was codified, right, formalized, consolidated into law, if you call that a law, about 20 years later, from 1895 until uh, 1913. It was simply a de facto arrangement. But then, with the coming of the Federal Reserve System in uh, in, uh, 1913, it becomes a uh, an institution devoted to serving the banks of the banks by the banks for the banks, and this is what we want to counterattack now: that the Federal Reserve has to be nationalized. Its goal is not to serve the banks, but to maintain full employment, economic progress, rising standards of living, increased longevity, rising organic composition of capital, in other words, a greater level of capital investment per job, and uh, a series of other criteria which would uh, correspond to economic modernization and uh, continuous uh, economic boom. There's no reason not to have it. So that is the, the, the thing in a nutshell. Now, Theodore Roosevelt, we've got, we've got silly Doris Kearns Goodwin out there again, uh, writing about uh, William Howard Taft and Theodore Roosevelt. And the point was that by the time Wall Street wanted to codify and consolidate that sellout by Grover Cleveland, in other words, the arrangements of 1895 had to be carved in stone, and it would have been hard to do that with the old guard of the Republican Party person- personified by Taft. So what you had was the partners of Morgan brought Theodore Roosevelt out of retirement and threw him into the field with the uh, Bull Moose Party, the Liberal Republican, Bankers Republican Party, uh, which the, the effects of which are, include the Bush family, uh, among others. Uh, the Theodore Roosevelt gang were expendable. The goal was to split the Republican Party, bring in the racist Woodrow Wilson, governor of New Jersey, he had gone from uh, from being president of Princeton, then governor, then president, all in Obama-like speed, and uh, he was then willing to sign that uh, into law in his first year in office. And with that, the sellout, the crime of 1895 by Grover Cleveland becomes the legal structure, institutional structure of Woodrow Wilson 1913, and we're still dealing with that, right? The Humphrey-Hawkins Act tried to mitigate some of the worst excesses by adding full employment, but they don't take it seriously. And we have from Yellen that the only way you can help the real economy is through the banks. It is wrong. You can do it directly. You open up that credit stimulus window, 0% interest, 5 terra dollars, the terra tranche, the trillions. Five terra dollars. One terra dollar refinances all student loans at zero percent. Cut out the bloodsuckers and the usurers. Four terra dollars goes for launching your big infrastructure program. And we'll talk about some of the science driver effects that should also be pursued. So you want somebody with a program as head of the Fed or as vice chairman of the Fed, I will fight tooth and nail for a for the full nationalization, as much as I can. But at the same time, I will fight for a credit stimulus window that will make a tender offer to every state, every county, every authority to say, come forward with your shovel-ready big infrastructure contracts, and we're going to create 30 million jobs and get a recovery. And we're going to do it with the principles of uh, Lautenbach and Wojtynski, the principles of the New Deal, which these these two Germans uh, were able to codify, make it um, theorize them uh, more clearly, perhaps, than anybody else, although they never got to do it in reality, as was done here to a large extent. So those are some of the 
economic uh, interests. And if you don't do that, well, then you're joining in the slaughter of the innocents, aren't you? Um, in terms of the international scene, just very briefly, right, we've got flare-ups of terrorism now. We've got one of the advisors of the Hariri clan apparently killed in Beirut, right? Hariri is NATO's man in the Levant. He's a key part of the logistical system for the death squads in Syria. This is uh, a troubling event. Uh, and we've also got a bomb going off in Pyatigorsk in the Stavropol region of southern Russia. In other words, not so far from Sochi, where the Olympic Games are now going to open in less than two months. Um, the Syrian army continues to make progress. Um, today, Friday the 27th, we're told that the Syrian army ambushed Islamist fighters in the Kuala Moon Mountains north of Damascus with 60 rebels being killed, according to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, which is, of course, a, uh, uh, in, it is inspired by British intelligence, needless uh, to say. Uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, Syrian television shows you one of the survivors, one of the rebels who survived this ambush, saying there were about 400 of us, including Saudis, Chechens, and other nationalities, says one of these fighters. So there, there it is again. It's not an indigenous rebellion. These are foreign mercenaries. They're estimated to be 100,000 of them. They must all go home. And we're waiting still for the liberation of Aleppo. Let it come as soon as possible. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in uh, Washington, D.C. Do take a look at the Russian fleets of September, October 1863 in the C-SPAN video library under uh, Tarpley. And, um, well, uh, it is certainly one of the most popular uh programs on C-SPAN having to do with the sesquicentennial of the Civil War and uh, with a certain amount of um, help from friends, it might well uh, get rebroadcast because I see that they're rebroadcasting some other, um, some other uh, anniversary events, the one on the uh, Chickamauga Chattanooga uh, battle, the two-hour one. Uh, has now been uh, rebroadcast despite a much lower level of uh, interest than uh, than my Russian fleet's lecture. So again, we're waiting for the liberation of Aleppo. Uh, in terms of uh, Syria, right, everything now looks forward to the Geneva Conference, which is about a month away. And of course, the rebels uh, won't go. Uh, Assad will go, but he's not going to give up power. And the uh, U.S. policy is more and more bankrupt. The voices uh, attempting to get a war any way they can, more and more isolated, more and more hysterical. But this is typically the moment when the uh, false flag event is pulled out. And that killing of the Hariri uh, functionary in Beirut shows that these capabilities remain in place, and perhaps on an even larger scale, the Pyatigorsk, southern Russia, Stavropol region uh, bomb also shows that the time of the Sochi Olympic Games must be a time of great vigilance and great maturity so that people are not stampeded by whatever the diehard imperialist hardliners may decide to pull out. Now, it was the night before Christmas. And all through the House, uh, there was a widespread disgust about the interview with Edward Snowden, which became the headline story of the Washington Post. Tuesday, December 24th, headline story, big picture, the entire Washington Post above the fold. Edward Snowden, I already won. And there he is, unshaven, right? Is he imitating the old Arafat look? I don't know. Uh, I have already won, says the braggart Snowden. Well, 
uh, I quickly laid down a Twitter challenge to this faker. Dear Ed Snowden, if you are not a limited hangout, then please prove it by telling us something we do not know about a big covert operation of the CIA, of MI6, of the Israelis. Tell us about 9-11. Tell us about the Arab Spring. Tell us about the killing of Gaddafi. Tell us about the shipping of the death squads into Syria and their arming. Tell us about subversive operations involving Morsi of Egypt. Tell us something geopolitical, something big, something that matters. Uh, we're not going to hold our breaths on that one because he's had uh, plenty of time. Uh, even the Washington Post in the Wonk blog then responded, no, it's not in, you haven't won anything. There have been no significant substantive policy changes uh, as a result of your uh, revelations. The uh, the Washington Post claims his leaks have fundamentally altered the U.S. government's relation with its citizens and the rest of the world. Yeah, that's like saying he changed the national or indeed international conversation. But we know that it's always changing. It goes from Honey Boo Boo to Miley Cyrus to Madonna to Lady Gaga and then on to the NSA, but then soon back to Honey Boo Boo or whatever it is, uh, or the, the Duck Dynasty or uh, various other uh, possible themes. Um, in the course of this uh, interview, what I found notable is that he seems to be sending some messages to those who may still be his masters. Uh, he wants to steer the conversation to surveillance, democracy, and his documents. Notice he says, remember, I didn't want to change society. That's what he says. He has no program of any changes. I didn't want to change society. This is, is this a revolutionary? You tell me. I wanted to give society a chance to determine if it should change itself. And you think that this is primarily or exclusively a matter of NSA surveillance? All I wanted was for the public to be able to have a say in how they are governed. And uh, again, this is a matter of phone tapping or reading the Internet? Uh, I don't know. I am skeptical. And again, I'm more and more skeptical because... We're not getting anything. I'm by, my challenge to uh, Snowden would also be, give us something that will destroy the career of one big, odious U.S. politician. Do you have anything that will um, put paid to Hillary Clinton's presidential ambitions? Can you uh, expose one of the top libertarians or reactionary Republicans? Can you um, essentially go through any of this, right? Can you give us something we don't know about somebody in Britain? Can you bring down the uh, conservative government in Britain with GCHQ and all that? Or how about Netanyahu? He certainly must figure in some of these. So, Snowden, please, tell us something we don't know, because otherwise a lot of us figure that you are just another tentacle, just another limited hangout in this tiresome parade that goes back to Ellsberg and Assange and quite a few others. Remember the criteria. The uh, figure, the celebrated figure, uh, in this case the whistleblower, has a Damascus Road conversion. Remember in Ars Technica, this uh, magazine, uh, in January 2009, Snowden says those people should be shot in the testicles. That is to say, he's talking about Assange and other leakers, other people on Krypton or whatever it is, right? He's against them. He became an immediate media darling. He's got the London Guardian and the Washington Post with Barton Gelman in his corner. <laughs> this doesn't happen for people that are not um, favored by the establishment, please. I mean, how naive can we be? Uh, other whistleblowers with more explosive and more specific revelations are ignored by these same heroes of investigative journalism. 
We get nothing new, and I've gone through it. We get nothing big, nothing about 9-11, nothing that would blow the lid off the psychological control mechanisms. And, of course, this is being used to prepare new covert operations, as I've tried to point out. One of the things that, uh, that Snowden has done is to, uh, as, as uh, Van, Van Williams um, confessed on television, he said the, the termites really went to work on Obama's popularity back in June when the Snowden revelations came out. In other words, the relation of dupes and dupees, uh, dupers and dupe, dupes between Obama and his left liberal base, that went into crisis when Snowden was trotted out with his stories. And that, of course, is important because the oligarchical establishment controls president in the first term by their need to get money for a second term. And when they're in the second term, as we've seen from Nixon to Reagan to Clinton, they control the president by keeping him on the defensive under scandal attack. That is the second term jinx is simply a program of the oligarchy to prevent the president from uh, from doing whatever he might want to do. And in the case of Obama, that might be something horrendous, like uh, like uh, global warming uh, regulations, whatever. The whole thing is used to um, create new covert ops and create new careers. And Greenwald wants to be the guy whose career is made. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster top me here in Washington, D.C. So Snowden says he's already won. Uh, well, let's, let's compare him to uh, actual revolutionaries of the past, right? Um, you can compare it to the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the American Revolution, right? The real ones, right? The ones that actually created important institutional uh, changes, right? The American Civil War obviously counts as a second American revolution, without which the modern world would be simply unthinkable. Um, in case of uh, the 20th century, right, we had this question of what groups in society could be the historical protagonist of revolution, and the Marxists came forward and said, well, it's the industrial working class, it's the proletariat. Uh, in the case of Snowden and company, it's the hackers. It's uh, essentially marginal people, autistic sociopaths sitting in front of screens, people like uh, like Assange. And um, if I'm, by some strange coincidence, we, we're now getting the 30th year, the 30th, 3-0 anniversary, and it's continuing, of the Chaos Communications Conference in Hamburg, Germany, uh, the most British of all German cities, of course. Uh, and there we have uh, Assange will be holding forth and Glenn Greenwald, but they're going to be co-headlining that conference, I guess, in both cases by uh, webcam. So um, uh, this is um, a group that's been around, right? These are the hackers, right? These are the people who um, who act out, right? The Pirate Party, other spinoffs have been been taken off of this. But again... What is revolutionary here? Um, let's go back to uh, to Lenin. Right? Lenin certainly a revolutionary. Whatever you think of his methods, and I could I would criticize them a great deal. I think, uh, for example, Rosa Luxemburg's critique of Lenin has a lot of uh, merit, although it is also not not perfect. But Lenin had sloganized right everything: all power to the Soviets, peace, bread, land. A program that. Uh, was widely understandable in Russia at the time. Now, uh, if you wanted to boil down Assange and Snowden and Greenwald to a program, they would say, all power to the whistleblowers, transparency, privacy, and net neutrality. Yeah, all power to the whistleblowers, transparency, privacy, and net neutrality. Now, you can see what the problem is with that. We've got recent articles in the uh, Washington Post, even, about the digital divide. Even in the United States, there are lots of places that are still stuck with the obsolete dial-up Internet. And uh, we've still got, I think we've still got a majority of people in the world who have never made a phone call, quite apart from having uh, computers. In other words, this is a class distinction. There's a bright line 
class divide between Internet access and not. Right? This, uh, it's come up in Italy, uh, uh, among other things, because of the, the Internet fetishism of the five-star movement of Beppe Grillo that much of southern Italy and the poorer parts of the entire country are completely left out. But uh, transparency, privacy, and net neutrality? Suppose you're a victim of this depression. Your food stamps have been cut and your unemployment has been cut. You're starving. You're going to be evicted from your home under a foreclosure. Your kids can't continue their education because you can't pay the student loans and you can't pay the increased tuition. Your wife is sick and you can't get medical care. And the revolutionary... Snowden is going to come and say transparency, privacy, and net neutrality. You see here that um, Snowden is arguing that the essence of the human personality, in other words, the epiphany of who you are, is manifested in privacy. And I will say that is simply wrong. That is that is monstrously wrong. It is not in privacy that you show who you are. It is in revolutionary praxis. Who is strong? Who is good? This is not found in contemplating your own privacy. This involves going in public, going into the marketplace of ideas, going into the blood and sand of the arena, and if necessary, going onto the political battlefield, whatever that may look like. That is where the true worth or lack of it of an individual is manifested. So what you see here is it's a petty bourgeois class-based program, if you want to call it that, and it takes you away. It takes you in the opposite direction from what is needed, because what is needed is revolutionary mass action. To take a series of demands, the Wall Street sales tax, the nationalization of the Fed, the 30 million jobs, we'll have something to say about uh, a protective tariff. We want to add a protective tariff to that also to try to show uh, organized labor that uh, it is not enough to say no to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but it's going to be necessary to say 15% protective tariff so we don't have to compete with sweatshop labor across the world, right? It's a way to raise the minimum wage across the world if you do this right. Uh, but no, Snowden, and I guess ex- by extension Assange, I suppose they're, they're in friendly competition, the two of them, as the two of the leading narcissists of the age, that they would come forward and say, no, uh, privacy is the essence. Well, that, by definition, atomizes everybody, locks you into your own alienated private sphere. The whole point of of revolutionary action is to get you out of your alienated private sphere and into that area of uh, revolutionary praxis, or practice, whichever you like. Um, And therefore, I say this is is not going to do it. And I would say even more, as the mass upsurge of 2015 approaches. By the time we're into 2014, we're going to see the harbingers of that mass upsurge all over the place. This year already, 2013, we've seen Brazil, we've seen Turkey, we've seen Egypt, uh, we've seen mass strikes all across southern Europe, mass strikes against austerity. So these are the first rumblings As we go into 2014, those rumblings, especially in the springtime, and remember the springtime in the Mediterranean comes in January, February, as we saw in 1848 and as we saw then in uh, 2011. Um, It's going to be time for for those uh, harbingers of the big upsurge to come. At this point, the ruling class is going to start playing Cacciaturians, the comedian. They're going to say, bring in the clowns, and we'll explain what that means in just a minute. So our perspective here on World Crisis Radio is that 2015 is going to repeat 
the seven-year into the depression phenomenon that we associate with 1936, 1936 big mass strike up surges in Spain, in France, the Popular Front, and the United States, the uh, re-election of the New Deal on the most radical of all of Roosevelt's election platforms, followed then by the creation of the United Auto Workers, the United Steel Workers of America, or at least their emergence as mass uh, trade union organizations. Seven years into the Depression, 1929 to 1936, seven years into this Depression, 2008 to 2015. And already, in my view, 2014 is going to be dominated by this. We've seen this from think think tanks in London. We've seen Mélenchon of the French Parti de la Gauche, the left party, saying France is in 1788. In other words, on the brink of revolution. I would take that seriously. Sometimes people say more than they know. Maybe that's in this category. You can go and see the full uh, development of this thesis in my June speech to the Left Forum in New York. Now, of course, the ruling class knows this, too. At least parts of the ruling class do, not all of it. The ruling class that says... Let's let the emergency unemployment benefits run out at one, for 1.3 million plus 1.9 million families. They are not so much in touch with this uh, area. Right? Ruling class is a big thing. Uh, it's not homogeneous, uh, but some of them do know. And their response, as I say, is put on Cacciatorian's suite from the comedians and send in the clowns. Send in the clowns. Send in Russell Brand, the great revolutionary leader. We'd have, we'd have, we probably couldn't uh, say on the air what uh, his program might be, right? If, if uh, Lenin was all power to the Soviets, peace bred land, and Snowden is all power to the whistleblowers, transparency, privacy, and net neutrality, then uh, we have to see what Russell Brands would be. It's probably some sub substances, among other things, but also some practices that are probably now illegal or at least frowned on. Russell Brand. And then the comedians, the actual official comedians, the Pepe Grillos, the Dieudonnés, the Jesse Venturas, the Howard Stearns, and on and on. Uh, these characters will be dished up to some extent, or some of them will be, as leaders because they have mass recognition, of course. And we can add Snowden and Assange uh, as part of that phalanx. Send in the clown. Send in the misleaders send in the pathetic excuses for mass uh, leaders, mass organizers, mass uh, program bearers. So there's where we are. Um, in terms of Southern Europe, I just want to mention, we have this interesting uh, Italian economist, Giulio Sapelli, S-A-P-E-L-L-I, he is a Keynesian, um, I guess, by doctrine, but I think he's actually somewhat better than the usual Keynesian run of uh, certainly better than Krugman, uh, better than um, the, the U.S. Uh, brands of these things. And what Sapelli talks about, he says that um, a professor by the name of Giuseppe Guarino has uh, proposed a Latin bloc inside the European Union, starting with France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and that the purpose of this bloc would be to contest, to resist the ultra-austerity coming from the Bundesbank, coming from Merkel. That is long overdue. Sapelli points out a, a couple of interesting facts. He says uh, the, the hysteria of Merkel uh, about uh, the uh, European Union going the way of East Germany is is hypocritical because her father was a Lutheran minister in East Germany under the communist regime who collaborated. Unlike most Lutheran ministers who were fo focused points of resistance, her father was a collabo. He was a collaborator with the communist regime, and that's how Merkel got to become a scientist and get these... Uh, university courses back in the old uh, DDR. And Sapelli also quotes a document we're going to be looking at in the coming uh, 
weeks, the open letter by Helmut Schmidt to Hans Tietmeyer of the Bundesbank, 8th of November, 1996, in which Helmut Schmidt, experienced as Chancellor of Germany from the 70s to the 80s, warns the Bundesbank against their austerity policies, and he also points out that if you only have the German mark, that will be upvalued into the ionosphere, and German exports will be strangled. And this is the thing that all of the petty bourgeois critics of the euro have somehow not figured out, that if you're the Greek currency by yourself, you'll be destroyed. You'll be driven down to the center of the earth. But if you're the German currency, with all probability, you're going to be bid up so high that no German export could ever sell again in the world. So he says that this is coming from Romano Prodi, former Italian prime minister, candidate for president of Italy back earlier this year, and this guy Giuseppe Guarino, and Sapelli seems to be part of it. So we're going to try to look into that. Now, let's try to end on a couple of uh, notes here. First of all, I just mentioned the protective tariff, right? We've got this uh, fight going on now about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, I can hear the giant sucking sound once again. Remember, uh, Perot, crazy as he was on debt, uh, was certainly right when he said that free trade was a sellout and that it should not go through. And uh, Perot's debate with uh, Al Gore back in, uh, what was it, 1993-1994, that is the basis for the Democrats losing the Congress to Newt Gingrich in 1994, the giant sucking sound. It was the economic impact of NAFTA that uh, destroyed the Democratic majority that had uh, lasted since, what, 1948. So in this case, uh, we've got the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And once again, it's the U.S., Canada, Mexico, plus nine powers across the Pacific. And some of them are notable. Many of them, I'm afraid, are notable for their sweatshop labor. It is impossible. It is absolutely uneconomical to demand that uh, American workers compete with sweated labor from across the world. So, of course, you have to say no to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But, as we know, in politics as in war, there is no greater misery than to stand exclusively on the defensive. If you have no ability to counterattack, no ability to undertake your own offensive, you are doomed to lose. And that is why when austerity is the question, you counterattack with the Wall Street sales tax. And when we have this question of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the counter to that is the need for a protective tariff rooted deeply in American history, Remember, Henry Clay's American system, a national bank, infrastructure all across the country, and a protective tariff. And some would also add the promotion of science and technology at government expense. Some of those, if we mix in Alexander Hamilton with uh, the Henry Clay American system, we get something like, uh, like that. But the protective tariff was the mark of economic nationalism all through the 19th century. It remains so today. Take a look at my book, the uh, Surviving the Cataclysm. You'll see in there I recommend a, it's really a revenue tariff, but in today's world, a protective tariff, 10 to 15% on all imports. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. So there you have it. It is time to mobilize against the Trans-Pacific Partnership and indeed against any other uh, free trade deal. That includes the, the other ones that uh, Obama has uh, imposed. It's time to break out of these things. I'm afraid NAFTA is also uh, counterproductive in its current form. There should certainly not be any such free trade deal with the European Union. You'd be competing with sweated labor in Eastern Europe. These are ways to drive down uh, the uh, the uh, living standard here. If you're concerned about the middle class, you can't be for uh, free trade. But again, as a matter of politics and as a matter of, uh, of policy alternatives, you've got to have an alternative to it, and that is what is, again, in, re- in historical terms, it would be simply a revenue 
tariff of 10 to 15 percent. In today's terms, it would be considered a protective tariff. So call it a protective tariff. And again, if the 10 to 15 percent is not enough, then you can increase it. But if you can't get 10 to 15 percent, you're going to have a hard time getting uh, anything more. This is a chance to educate trade union forces about the American system. You can go back to speeches by um, William McKinley, by Andrew Stewart, by Henry Clay, by uh, Lincoln, right, by Justin Morrill. The Morrill tariff, as soon as the South was out of the Union, the uh, protective tariff, the Morrill tariff was brought in, and that is what made the world's greatest industrial power and ushered in the modern world. Similarly, in Germany at the same time, the German school of Friedrich List imposed a protective tariff, which led to rapid industrialization. Germany soon passed the British, and the Austrian school is a uh, an attempt to counterattack that uh, wonderful progress. Now, positive element here at the end. Fusion energy. Here we go. Now, remember, gold is where you find it, so hang on, brace yourself. George F. Will of the Washington Post, and now of Fox News, right? not even of ABC, but of Fox. George F. Will, known as Will the Shill, but in this case, hats off to Will the Shill. A dazzling bright future dawns in New Jersey, and he does not mean, he does not mean Christie, the Garden State Girling, but he means the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory and the new NSTX fusion reactor. It is a tokamak. This is not fission power. This is not uranium. It's not plutonium. It's not even thorium. It is water. It's tritium and deuterium. It runs on uh, nuclear, thermonuclear fusion power. It's not the the principle of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it's the principle of the uh, hydrogen uh, bomb. But, of course, in this case, it is clean. It does not produce radioactive waste. It, the fuel is abundant, and the energy payoff is absolutely huge. So the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory is in the process of recovering. I've been telling you a little bit about this, right? This is now the NSTX, which is... Uh, now expected to begin giving uh, its uh, results, and of course, this has a this, the reason that this has taken so long uh, is because the original, the old uh, uh, fusion tokamak or tokamak fusion test reactor. This was also at the at the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory that was shut down through cuts in the late 1990s. The, the tokamak fusion test reactor had created this <clears throat> temperature record of about 260 million degrees, much higher than anything ever observed in nature, much higher than anything in the center of a star or the center of a galaxy or anything else that we've ever been able to measure. That was shut down in the late 90s. Then came the Stellarator, which was a modified tokamak design. That was shut down uh, about uh, 2007, 2008. Uh, actually, the decision to shut it down was made under Bush, Bush the Younger, which Will the Shield tries to uh, to hide. But now uh, we are on the brink of the biggest progress in human history. And uh, again, I don't mind uh, reflecting that this has been brought to the attention of the public by somebody like uh, Will. Uh, this will be the achievement which will be more transformative of human life than any prior scientific achievement, because it essentially wipes out penury, it wipes out scarcity of energy, abundant energy, universally available, based on seawater or any other kind of water you need to find, and this will then power humanity for the entire relevant historical future. So you don't need to fight about oil. You don't need to worry about carbon. It escapes all of the ideological polemics. And the idea is you've got to, uh, if people may know this, um, I first became aware of the fusion issue in the early 1950s as a very young child. 
I had a book about cosmology by George Gamow, G-A-M-O-W, and old George Gamow was telling you about the lithium hydrogen engine, and he said, yeah, well, this could give really unlimited energy, lithium and hydrogen. The problem is, how do you contain it? What kind of walls can you use? The stars use gravity to uh, contain it. And so what do you do? Well, the idea is you use magnetic fields to contain it. So the United States is now spending a minuscule $2.5 billion over 10 years for this. The Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory has gone in recent decades from 1,400 employees to 450. Uh, they have not prospered under Obama. Now, Will, of course, Will wants to say, well, let's rip off Social Security, let's rip off Medicaid and so forth, and we'll use that to build these, uh, these tokamaks. It's like, the, uh, like Blumenauer, who says, let's rip off people with the gas tax and we'll build some infrastructure. I'm sorry. Wall Street will pay, and the Federal Reserve will provide uh, the financing. Now, of course, um, the other aspect of this is it takes a lot of computing power. I'm aware now of the Titan computer. The Titan computer sits in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, right, formed under the Manhattan Project. The Titan computer of Oak Ridge, Tennessee, does 17 quadrillion calculations per second. Don't let Wall Street get their hands on the Titan computer or we'll be dealing with 17 quadrillion trades per second. But of course, with the Wall Street sales tax, after 100 trades, it's all over because you've uh, wiped out your, uh, your capital. So um, the, the notion is now that after the, the dismantling of the tokamak fusion test reactor, which had reached those record temperatures, after the dismantling of the Stellarator, which was promising, but which was then mothballed, we've now got the NSTX, which um, we talked about uh, previously on the program, and this is the prelude now to the ITER. And the ITER is this uh, operation in the south of France. It is a joint program of the United States, the European Union, Russia, China, India, Japan, Korea, the main uh, economic and scientific powers of the world. It is at a place called Kardash, C-A-R-D, A-R-C-H-E, Card Arch, Card Arch. And uh, that's going to be the site, that's going to be the sinecure of humanity in the coming decade uh, as they attempt to go beyond break-even to a sustained uh, production of energy, and that will then be the immediate prelude to a, a, uh, an initial pilot commercial reactor. Uh, this is the great promise now on the uh, on the uh, horizon of mankind. Notice that the forces active in the U.S. Congress to cut this stuff down are Malthusian forces in alliance with big oil, okay, and other backward forms of energy, right? And uh, therefore, this is the the promise. So we've got to do something about this. Remember, in the space area, one of our science drivers, we now have no manned space flight technology. The Cassini probe, which sent back such beautiful pictures of Saturn, is in danger. And in terms of our biomedical research, that has been disrupted massively by the sequester this year. Uh, the only area where we have any hope of making any breakthrough is the Princeton Plasma Physics and ITER fronts. But we've got to gear up to refund the space program and the biomedical research through the NIH. These are now immediate priorities for 2014. So happy new year to all and uh, keep fighting always. See you next year on World Crisis Radio. Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tufty speaking from Washington, D.C., and we're recording our broadcast on the afternoon of Friday, December 27th. So we're right in the middle of the 12 days of Christmas and the holiday season in general, and we uh, wish everybody uh, the best of, uh, of everything in the old year and the new year. 
Now, we're on the eve of a dramatic event. Uh, as of tomorrow, the 28th of December, the extended unemployment benefits will be cut off for 1.3 million American families. This is a bipartisan betrayal of the public interest. It is a betrayal with overtones of genocide, because since we've had the cuts in food stamps, we're now in the second month of reduced food stamp benefits. So now that we're towards the end of December, just at the time that abundance was rejoicing in the Christmas holiday, that's the time when many of these stricken families were running out of food stamps to put food on the table. And that certainly happened already around Thanksgiving in November, and it's happening again now in December. And those food stamp cuts have to be restored. But now, even more serious for the people that are, that are involved, the sole source of income, 1.3 million families, now immediately on the 28th of December, followed soon by 1.9 additional million families, 1.9 million families during the course of 2014 for a total of 3.2 million families. So we're talking about 10 million people. And the question is, how many will have to die? How many children, how many sick people, old people, cripples, and so forth? How many will die? And those deaths go to the account of the Republican Party primarily with a secondary role for the Democrats. But in line with our general perspective here, it is certainly the lion's share goes to the Republican Party, and therefore that part bill with jobs, government jobs in this case, created by a small uh, Wall Street sales tax, what he calls a, a transaction tax. So here we are. On the eve of the Holy Innocence, and this time it's going to be American families with, with their children that pay the terrible price. 1.3 million families, as of the Feast of the Holy Innocence, will be high and dry. Now, we've also got, as I said, cuts in food stamps for the second month. We've got a situation with the minimum wage which is getting worse all the time and needs urgent relief. The answer in terms of every part of this that has government spending behind it is the Wall Street sales tax. This is now the spirit of the age. It is the uh, idea whose time has come. The Wall Street sales tax. The only way you can find revenue to pay for a social safety net worthy of the name is to break the immunity of Wall Street against taxation and make them pay, make them pay their federal income tax on turnover, but above all, on, on profits, but above all, make them pay a tax on turnover. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Choices Radio. We're here in Washington, D.C., inviting you during the uh, holiday time when you may have a little bit of uh, free time here and there. Take a look at C-SPAN and check out my lecture on the Russian fleets, right? We've had another round of hysterical anti-Russian, anti-Putin propaganda. We've got uh, uh, Khodorkovsky being released. That becomes an occasion for hysterical attacks on uh, Putin. We've got uh, the Pussy Riot released. We've got Greenpeace fanatics uh, and uh, people who are obviously doing some pretty uh, dangerous maneuvers there in the Arctic Ocean. They're being released, hysterical anti-Putin attacks. And, of course, uh, Ukraine, where it looks like the NATO provocateurs have been defeated for the moment. There is even an attempt to expand this into Belarus. This is done by Anne Applebaum, among others, the wife of the Polish foreign minister Sikorsky, but she appears as a columnist in the Washington Joseph has to get St. Mary in the night and flee into Egypt. This is the flight into Egypt, one of, one of the great subjects of Renaissance uh, painting. Uh, Herod 
when he saw that he was not getting any intelligence from the wise men, sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. And there we have it. That's the slaughter of the innocents. And, of course, the uh, wise men, the magi coming from the east, eventually do get to see uh, Jesus, right? Remember that the January 5th is 12th night. That's the last of the 12 days of Christmas. But then, January 6th, the epiphany, the time when you get to see what's what. You get to see, in this case, the face of of God. So, the holy innocence. Now, what, 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 what a more horrible irony that we should be in this day and age, right after 2,000 years of Christianity, we're going to have the new slaughter of the innocents, except this time in the role of King Herod, we have the reactionary monsters of the Republican Party and, of course, their Wall Street Democratic uh, cohorts. But remember, if you smash the Republican Party, this entire dog and pony show falls apart. And my estimate is that the Republican Party is closer to collapse than the Democratic one. Both show signs of severe uh, distress, of course, right, as we see in all the polls, right? But the Republican Party is more ripe for collapse than the Democrats, and that also then opens up the positive scenario of breaking the Democratic Party into two parts with the plutocratic Wall Street Democrats of Obama, Schumer, Durbin, and the rest of them, Pelosi, against the populist, the people with some labor connections or some New Deal nostalgia or something of this sort, the Sherrod Brown, the Elizabeth Warren, Marcy Captor, DeFazio, and the rest of them. Uh, uh, Congressman Conyers of uh, Michigan certainly would would qualify with his uh, jobs and post, and they don't label every time that she's the uh, relative by marriage of the Polish foreign minister, right? One of the leading hotheads and provocateurs, this uh, Sikorsky. Um, so that's, uh, that's what's going on, and that's why the lecture on the Russian fleets, I submit, is extremely timely. It shows a bedrock of uh, positive cooperation which can uh, only be ignored at the peril of everybody in the world. And one of the things that we're seeing, and we may see it even more in January, is that we are going, certainly in the Middle East, maybe not in the rest of the world, but a U.S.-Russian condominium can be discerned through the mist and the smoke and the uh, hysterical propaganda, the idea is that if anything positive is going to get done, it's going to be on the model of the solution to the Syrian chemical weapons. We'll talk some more about Syria in a minute. So the idea is that if you're going to do a reenactment of the three kings, right, we three kings of Orient are, uh, then you're going to have to have Herod. King Herod has to appear, right, that mean oppressor, that, uh, that killer. King Herod. Who's going to play the role of King Herod this time? Should it be Rand Paul, who wanted to cut off the unemployment benefits? And he said I, he's doing them a favor, because, boy, if you have on your resume that you haven't worked for more than 26 weeks, you'll never get another job again. So little Rand is helpfully going to, uh, going to come and, uh, and, and avoid that for you, right? You won't be able to get more than 26 weeks of unemployment benefits, if that under the Rand Paul regime. Little Rand, who uh, uh, has never wanted in his life and who has never known uh, hardship or anything of the sort, uh, is there to tell you that, uh, boy, it's really bad if you get your resume soiled with too many weeks of unemployment benefits. Or maybe we should have Boehner play the role of King Herod, right, since he's the one who prevented this from going through. Or maybe it's Mitch McConnell, or maybe it's others, and of course, among the retainers, right? Among the uh, among the scribes, we've got plenty of room for Harry Reid and uh, and D- Schumer and Durbin and Pelosi and so forth. But the principal villain, right? The star villain 
is the Republican part of this show. Somebody must be destroyed. The Republican Party must be destroyed in place during 2014 as part of a mass strike upsurge, which will be building, in my estimate, by the time of the October to November election wrap-up. Now, ironically, the 28th of December, this is when the, the cutoff will occur. That falls on a Saturday this year. Let's go back and just take a look at the Gospel according to St. Matthew, because we're talking now about the festival of the Western Church known as the Holy Innocents. It is the time when the oppressive King Herod, king of the uh, puppet state created by the Roman Empire in Judea, Herod ordered the killing of all young children. So we have in Matthew uh, 2, 1 to 23, uh, the, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, trying to find uh, the uh, infant whose coming had been foretold, foretold by the star. And they ask. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we are come to worship him. When Herod the king heard those things, he was troubled. And when he gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And when Herod called the wise men, he inquired of them diligently, what time the star appeared. And then, the, treacherously, he said, Go and search for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. And, of course, the goal was uh, to, uh, to kill the possible competitor for the post of uh, king of Judea. So God has to warn St. Joseph in a dream saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And 